one of the top skills that we can teach our children for now and into the future. And sadly, a skill that we are not really taught in school is articulation. It's the ability to express ourselves, the ability to convince somebody, the ability to win an argument, if you would. Uh, at work, we obviously use it a lot, how we collaborate with colleagues, how we sell an idea to, to the management. But we do, we articulate ourselves in, in relationships with our children, with our siblings. Um, but we were never really taught how to do it. We kind of just learn as we go. But it's possibly the top skill I think we can have. The ability to express yourself correctly, whether it's in spoken language or in written language. It's becoming an even more important skill these days with the advent of AI and in particularly large language models. And, and what I want to just explain to you today and, and just give you a few tips on is how to better articulate yourself to a chat GPT or a Gemini or a co-pilot or, or the vast array of these large language models that we are aware of and that I'm sure all of us are using. But a lot of people I know are quite frustrated. Um, I'm going to refer a lot today to chat GPT and I'm going to also later on in the demo use chat GPT. I'm also going to jump a bit to Google Gemini, which I find fascinating. But um, people tell me we just don't get from it what we want. And then when I sit with them and I see what they actually put into the prompt box, in other words, the way they articulate to the AI what they want is often really lacking. It's short. You don't really tell the AI what you want. And I'm going to give you a few tips today. Some of the slides are going to be quite busy. There's a number of definitions I want to work through, but these slides will also be made available after the session. Um, there's a number of tips, about eight or nine tips I'm going to give you that you should keep in mind when you articulate yourself to a large language model. Now, just a bit of a definition, and I'm not going to read every slide um, in detail, but an LLM is a type of AI trained on a vast amount of data, text data in particular, to understand and generate human-like text. And I'm going to speak about multimodality today as well, because these days it's not just text and predicting text. We're seeing that audio, um, music making, the creation of images, um, the understanding of spoken language, and so forth, or the, the understanding of a PDF document that you have um, incorporated into the LLM. Those multimodality capabilities are increasing. And, and for interest's sake, and this is a bit scary if you think about it, people say that in the next three to five years, these large language models will be about a thousand times more powerful than they are now. As with all things technology or any tool that we use, it is neutral. But the potential for good is incredible. And the potential for bad is also incredibly bad. Um, the potential business cases around large language models, and I'll give you one use case today as an example. There are so many benefits. If you think of a contact center, imagine your client calls you and the AI is reading the, the, the orb, transcribing the text and giving you as a contact center agent a number of suggestions. Uh, pulling in certain data sets to really help that customer. But imagine also what can be done when it comes to deep fakes, which is becoming a big problem in our world today. Deep fake, as if you don't know, is when you take somebody's voice and or image and you transpose it over an existing voice or, or an image or a video. And these days that technology is so powerful that it's almost indistinguishable to between the real and the fake. Imagine you, you get an email from your boss that is written exactly in her mannerisms, the way she would typically write an email. And it's an instruction to do something. And because it's that, she, so she might in her email always say, hey, yo, how are you doing, comma, and then the email. So receiving an email produced by a large language model that mimics that person perfectly can really give us a lot of problems. And a lot of organizations are struggling with this. Is how do we pick up when it's a large language model that is mimicking a client instruction or a manager instruction. But essentially what it is, is it's predictive text, but like supercharged. So as I'm typing in my prompt, 
it's understanding what I'm asking for, and then it's using billions and billions of data sets to predict every next word in split seconds. That's essentially what a large language model is. This is the multi-modality that I spoke about, and I'm going to show you in the demo today. If you ask it for a, a layout for a slide deck, you know what should the first five slides be entitled or titled? And maybe what are some of the sub points, but also give me a, a relevant or a suitable picture for each slide. Imagine you can incorporate a, a recorded meeting file where you did an audio recording of a meeting and we see that Microsoft Teams is already doing it. And there are a number of platforms that can on the fly and in real time transcribe that meeting. Uh, some of the demos I've seen and we're going to talk a little bit about um, some of the Microsoft products today is it can also automate the actions from that meeting. We have all taken meeting notes. I mean, I hate it because you're not really focusing on the meeting. You're focusing on writing everything down as quickly as possible. And then you have to go and type it up or you have to go and double check your spelling and all that before you send it out. And then people have to manually allocate tasks to the people who were in the meeting. But these days we actually, and sometimes it's not as good as we think. It does struggle with our particular pronunciation. Um, it's really made for more of an American kind of English, and in particular the East Coast American English. But the idea is that from that meeting, the actions that I said I would do this and I would send that email to the client, etc., are automatically attributed and sent to me. So the creation of content creation of video files. We've, we've seen some of the, the demos of what uh, OpenAI is doing. In particular, I think people in the film industry, in the media industry is really worried with the amazing ability to create movie scenes so accurately. And it's really becoming a democratized technology. It's no longer in the hands of a few specialists, data scientists, AI engineers. It's easier for people like me and you who are not necessarily experts to really use this technology to enhance our work um, even our hobbies um, to play around with things to, to make amazing things like great invites but not just text invite to a birthday a video invite and so forth so it'll be interesting to see as this technology becomes a thousand times more powerful what impact it will have on us as workers as content creators um, as people just go through swaths emails every day. And we've already seen like Copilot and Gemini can do that, where it will summarize all your emails. It will prioritize your emails. It already can be a suggested reply that you just need to approve or maybe uh, edit. So large language models and multimodality is really where we are now. And this technology will become more and more powerful. Here's just a, a quick view of, of some of the technology. I'm not going to go through the slide in detail, but there are multiple platforms at the moment. Yes, OpenAI really put the world on its head. What was that about two or so years ago with the release of ChatGPT? Um, but then we saw so Microsoft acquiring a $10 billion stake, and then it's infused in pretty much all the Office 365 products at the moment. But we see Meta or Facebook doing it, Google doing it, and others. It's really this arms race, this AI arms race for large language models and multimodality. And I think we will see a number of entrants. The, the company I want to suggest you keep an eye on is Apple. Apple, over the last, I think, year, acquired about 100 AI startups. And there's already news that they are incorporating these kind of technologies into Siri. Now, I'm an Apple user. Siri frustrates me. Half the time, it doesn't understand what I'm asking it to do. But now imagine if a company like Apple with all the power behind them jumps into this race, what we will see, it'll hopefully just benefit us as consumers and as businesses, but it's definitely an arms race. And um, even just this year, we're gonna see some amazing things and some scary things. I always say that we're living in an era where we go from just questions to answers. If you search, whether it's a Google search or a Bing search or whatever, uh, search uh, engine you use, you essentially don't get an answer. I always say you get homework. This is just a screenshot from this morning. I asked Google, what's the tutorial like? What's the weather like today? And it gave me a number of websites. Now, what makes um, search engines so powerful is the fact that it can find the right websites, 
very accurately and very quickly. But I still need to click on most of these links to really get to the answer I was looking for. I hope it's not too noisy, uh, Colleen, but uh, and I hope my, my microphone is okay. No, um, it's, it's still fine. You can continue. Okay, super. But I've, Google or Bing is not giving me the answer. It's giving me homework. But what we see more and more these days, and in Bing in particular with its open AI integration, uh, also in Google more and more with its Gemini integration, is that depending on how you've set it up, on the left of your screen, you will still see what you're seeing now. It's the links, but on the right, there will be a text box that will actually give you the answer. So what is the weather like today? It should know from my IP address that I am at the airport at the moment and just tell me whether it's cloudy, whether it's going to rain. In other words, take the homework away from me and just give me the answer. And I'm going to show you how this can apply to a business context. Because especially if you are working or have worked in a large organization, access to information is often a massive problem. There are so many portals to go to. There are so many policy documents. Um, there's so many files all over the show of, of different uh, data on different clients that it takes us a lot of time to just find the answer we're looking for. And often we can't even find it, which is a huge frustration. And I'll show you an example as a case study. And this is actually a project I worked on for a client a few months back and from an HR point of view. So say this is the question I have. I want to take paternity leave from the 5th of November. What is our policy and how do I go about it? That's a question. Please don't give me homework. Now, typically what will happen is we need to access a number of things. Firstly, I need to go to our HR portal to see if I can find out from one of these drop down boxes when I apply for leave and I maybe click on paternity leave if it even appears there. Of course, often it doesn't. What, how many days? When can I take it? What kind of approval do I need? And so forth. Secondly, I need to go look at our policies. What is our HR policy around paternity leave? Also, what is the what does the labor law say? And are we compliant to what the labor law says? Next, I need to look at the, the calendar. You know, is are there weekends over that time that I want to take a paternity leave? Are there public holidays? The next thing I need to do is look at my work allocation. Am I already booked to a client project, for instance? And does that project fall over the time that I want to take leave? And if so, what do I do next? Do I speak to my line manager? Do I speak to the client? So to just get an answer for this simple question, it probably will take me 30, 40 minutes, one or two hours. Now imagine all the different things that you need answers to from a day-to-day -day perspective, uh, whether it's client inquiries, whether it's colleagues, whether it's your manager saying, can you quickly give me an update on this, that, and the other? spreadsheets, PowerPoint slides. It's, it takes a lot of time and, and sometimes it feels to me like we're not really doing work. So apart from doing emails and meetings, the rest of the time we're trying to find information. Now imagine this. A lot of clients are looking, that I deal with, are looking at building large language models ring-fenced in their businesses. What I mean with that is if you ask ChatGPT or Google Gemini or others information, especially when you copy and paste sensitive information into the prompting field. You have no idea where that data is going. We have seen over the last few months that now and then there's a security breach of ChatGPT. There was a case a few months ago where certain people could see other people online as well, where I could see what other people are prompting it. And there was even a scary case where people's payment information if you're on the paid for the $20 a month version of ChatGPT, where my card detail, my banking detail became available to others, it's a massive concern. So you can't ever take privacy related information, confidential information, and actually copy and paste that into um, ChatGPT. Colleen, I just want to check, am I still audible? And can you still see the slides? Sound is good. Slides we can see. Your cool. face itself is, is still is breaking up a bit, but we okay. but audio Super. is fine. Okay, yeah. cool. Because I just saw my camera like disappear, so I thought I lost you guys. All right. Now, okay, let's go back to this. 
I need to take paternity leave from the 5th of November. What is the policy? How do I go about it? So imagine that there's a platform that can access and it's securely access all the various systems in our organization. And imagine this is the reply I get like in a chat GPT example. Our leave policy for paternity leave is seven days. Labor law dictates five days. If you start paternity leave on the 5th of November, you can take seven working days. But take into account that you will also have an additional three days of annual leave available at that time. Also remember that you have been booked on a project for client ABS at that time. So you will need to check in with your line manager first. Can I set up a call with your manager, book a meeting or draft an email for you? One example. This is instant feedback. Now, yes, it all has to do with the maturity of your company data, the accessibility of the data, how you set it up. But now imagine you had the same query for a client while you were on a call or while you were in a meeting. Imagine you, you sitting with a client and they say, uh, is my account up to date? And, and what are my payment terms again? And just give me a summary of the next few invoices I need to pay. 30 minutes worth of work at least. Imagine you can just prompt that and it gives you the answer. Imagine you have a portal that your clients can directly access where they can find this kind of information. Like the product I ordered from you, when will it be shipped? Is it on the way already? How will I receive it? Do I need to sign for it when I receive it? Do I need to prove my identification? All of that can be answered by these models very quickly. This will revolutionize client services um, and client experience. This will revolutionize how we work together as a team and in an organization. I see a lot of our big banks and a lot of our telcos and insurance companies on this journey already. A lot of them are struggling. Again, business case is not always there. The data isn't always available. It's not always as mature as we want it to be. I recently had a very pleasant experience with my mobile provider's chatbot. Now, I tested this chatbot a few months ago and it was horrible. Because a lot of chatbots are just a glorified, frequently asked questions FAQ portal. But I recently had an in inquiry around my billing. There was something wrong on my invoice. Um, and at first, it asked me to verify my identity, which one would expect. But because it had all the contextual data of who I am, which package I'm on, how much data I use, and so forth, it very accurately answered my question. And in fact, it gave me more relevant information than I just asked for. I was pleasantly surprised, but it's because their data is mature and they have all the data on me. I want to give you another example. If I go to my favorite restaurant and I have a chatbot that pops up and it says, uh, what, what do you want? And I say, um, are you open on Tuesday? Because Tuesday is a public holiday. Or what time are you open on Tuesday? It would typically just give me a link or it just give me the information that I could have found online. And it won't answer my question. It'll give me all the opening hours. But I didn't ask for all the opening hours. I asked for that day in particular because it's a holiday. Now, imagine that restaurant has a mobile portal. I'm logged in. It, it knows about me. It knows the kind of food I like, the kind of food I've ordered before, uh, when I typically visit. So in that case, using this kind of technology, it would say, Mr. Stain, on Tuesday we are open, but only at nine because it's a public holiday. We see from our data, you typically arrive at about 10 o'clock and you like a cappuccino when you walk in. Would you like to make a booking so that when you walk in on Tuesday at 10, we have your cappuccino ready for you? Oh, and by the way, on that day, we have these specials aligned to your particular taste of food. Anything you'd like to order so long? Maybe a silly example, but it's a real conversation based on the data, this predictive analytics involved. This really is the power of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, we spoke about, or I mentioned it, uh, Microsoft Copilot and Google Gemini. Now, if you're a Microsoft 365 user and you have the right licensing, and, and perhaps some of you have already experimented with this, it is incredible. And Colleen will later on, um, before we end off, just talk a bit about some of the training that CTU offers on this. It's powerful technology. We are probably not, as users, even scratching the surface on what it can do. But to analyze a spreadsheet, to essentially take everything in your Microsoft uh, 365 environment is, is powerful. Again, summarizing emails, prioritizing emails, 
automating certain tasks. I played with it where I had five different spreadsheets open with a lot of different data. And I asked for it to look, or I asked it to look for relevant connections on the other sheets to this number or this person's name or whatever. And it started attaching all the relevant information on all the relevant slides. I love using Copilot in PowerPoint presentations. I prompted change all the backgrounds to green or change all the text to this font or move some of the slides around so that it makes a bit more sense from a storyline point of view. Incredible. Same with Google Gemini. If you are a, a Google user, I, I use Google a lot, uh, Google Drive, um, Calendar, um, essentially the whole Google suite, the workspace suite. I played around with it a few days ago, again, where I said, I remember I sent an email, but I couldn't remember to whom, but it was about a meeting in the free state somewhere in December. I put that in my prompt and it pulled up that email for me. It would have taken me forever or it pulled up that document from my drive. Really powerful. Again, can you imagine what this is doing to our productivity, to our access to information, to helping us be better at our work? So some of you might be far down this prompting journey, but essentially, as you can see on the definition there, it's to elicit a specific response or an output. And why a lot of people are frustrated with using ChatGPT and, and other platforms is because the way we interact with it is inadequate. Remember I spoke about articulation at the beginning of our slides. There are so many things that you can just tweak in how you talk to ChatGPT or Gemini and other platforms that will give you so much better. The trick here, honestly, is to not be lazy. Don't just give it one prompt. Sometimes you have to re-prompt it and say, but that's not what I asked for, or maybe take uh, this out of the text, uh, remove all the capital letters. Um, I actually want it in pointed format, not in paragraph format. Um, have you considered these kind of scenarios? Keep on prompting until you get the answer that you are looking for. It, it takes a bit of work, but after a while you get used to it. So let me give you an example. If I say, write me an article of 600 words on the current state of politics in South Africa, it'll be quite interesting. Um, it's often fairly relevant information. But if you just use the word expert, write me an expert article on XYZ, the kind of data that you get is a lot more relevant and a lot more impressive. But keep on tweeting, keep on using certain keywords, certain personas, which I'll take you through shortly. So here's just a screenshot of what ChatGPT typically look like. Now, I use it a lot for my work, so I am on the pro plan, $20 a month. It is, for me, absolutely worth it. But if you wanna just play around with it, use it for some basic things, you don't need to pay for it. And um, of course, play with it before you start committing to it. So you can cancel it at any time. But essentially what you see on the screen here, and this is very similar to Gemini and the other platforms is, at the, and it's not very clear here, but I'll show you in the demo. And again, you guys are most likely all very familiar with this. You have your prompting box at the, at the bottom, but on the left, you've got your history of previous prompts um, arranged by topic. And something that a lot of people don't know is, if you, if you started chatting with ChatGPT or Gemini on a specific topic, um, when you want to go back to that topic, click here on the left on, on, on that topic because it will remember the context of that whole conversation. Because if you start a whole new chat, some of the previous explanations that it's given, it's given you, it'll probably redo. Uh, it hasn't necessarily learned from your interaction if you use a brand new prompt. So keep on going back and keep on building on those previous prompts according to topic, and you will start seeing more and more accurate and impressive kind of um, replies. So here's just a list of what I briefly want to go through, and, and, and you'll see every slide on every one of these topics is, is somewhat busy. Don't try and memorize it now necessarily, but when you receive the slides, perhaps even print them out and put them near your desk. So you keep in mind some of these tricks that I'm going to and principles that I'm going to share with you now. And then I'm going to talk about some chat GPT plugins. And, and again, all these platforms have plugins. And then I'm going to just do a bit of a demo that hopefully you will find uh, very interesting. So I hate doing this, but I'm going to just read through these slides and then I'm going to give you an example. So the first principle 
in articulating yourself accurately to an AI platform is learn to start prompts with an action verb and define clear end goals. So again, don't just prompt it with three words. I sometimes write up to three different paragraphs before I press enter because I'm very specific on what I want. And then I go back and I reprompt it and I change a lot of my original prompt. So what is your end goal? I need to do something. It's an action verb. I need to analyze or whatever in order to see if there's a trend in X, Y, Z. Understanding the importance of directive language and AI prompting and practice formulating concise tasks. And here's an example. Calculate. So that's the action word. That's what I wanted to do. The monthly growth percentage based on the provided sales data from January to December. Obviously, you'll have to put that data into it first. But what do you want it to do and for what? I need you to analyze, calculate, understand, translate in order to. And that is important. So this is perhaps the most important, I think, of everything I'm going to show you now. Um, when it comes to articulating yourself to an AI. Contextual mastery. Explore how to provide relevant background information for nuanced AI responses. Delve into crafting prompts with rich context tailored to specific scenarios. Here's the example. Given the recent changes in international trade laws, analyze the potential impact on small businesses in Europe. Now, you're going to probably have to put more in. You're going to probably have to look for a specific article or link, and I'll show you in my demo how to use certain URL links. But perhaps a good start here is first to give it some data. So yes, three articles that I find interesting. Put those articles in and then say, so what is the scenario? What is the relevant background? So give the AI. Look, the AI has all this information already, but give it the background of what you want, especially if it's specific to our country. Because remember, most of the data that these platforms um, access are European, Northern American and other countries. But say, given the situation in South Africa around ESCOM over the last few months, give me an explanation of what the government said recently they will be doing. Here are four articles to consider. That kind of thing, the context around why you're asking. For the use of examples, discover the power of examples. Again, those articles, give it examples, and guiding the AI response. Include specific examples and frameworks. So, so keep on going back to, I've just seen this article. Here's a link or here's a copy and paste of it. This is a great example of, of how I also want to write my next article. But I want the article to be about topic X, Y, Z in order to. So for a business audience, so I often use this. I would say I need an expert article of about 600 words on artificial intelligence in the sub-Saharan context. The, the article will be aimed at non-technical business leaders. Break down the article in five different steps or topics. Make sure there is a group flow. Start the article with an introductory paragraph and make sure that the concluding paragraph links to the introductory paragraph. But there's about two or three paragraphs worth of prompting right there. Don't be lazy. Put in as much as you can and keep on experimenting and playing with it. Here's the example, drawing from the case study on Starbucks on the loyalty program. Design a customer loyalty program for a local coffee shop. So give it that information. It might already have it, but give it a document. Again, if multimodal, pull in that PDF or copy and paste it into your prompt. And say, here's the example that Starbucks uh, published. Use that example. But I have a much smaller coffee shop. In fact, I only sell coffee. I don't sell all the other foods, etc. And my coffee shop is in a very busy area where a lot of people walk past, so I need to serve them quickly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have to put a lot into that prompt. This one I really like: persona crafting. Learn to assign roles or personas for more targeted AI responses. Practice assigning and utilizing different personas to shape AI interactions. So what I can say as an educator to pre-primary students in a rural poor area who do not have access to the internet, as an example. I need to come up with a plan within them that will help them to learn something in seven days. Um, they won't have it digitally, so I need to print out pictures and explain things as an example. Here's the example. 
acting as a travel agent. In other words, you assign your persona, recommend a travel itinerary for a family of four visiting Japan for the first time. So what we can add here is visiting Japan in summer, visiting Japan and where in Japan, which city, at what time, and also how are we going there? I know we're going to fly there, but then we might take a boat. So keep on. So I'm, this is my persona. We are a family. I'm a business leader. I'm a student. This is what I need it for. And here are some of the nuances you have to keep in mind when giving me the response. Clarity, format for clarity and impact. Master the art of specifying output formats for organized and effective AI responses. Gain skills in defining the format. So not just I want something in order to, but that in order to, that goal, how do you want the goal to be presented to you? Do you want a spreadsheet? Do you want five paragraphs? Do you want one summarized paragraph? Do you need a picture that explains it? What is the format that you need the answer in? Here's the example, generate a report on recent AI research organized into sections, including introduction, methodology, results, and conclusion. Remember that article example. I need an introductory paragraph. I need a concluding paragraph linked to the introductory paragraph. And I need these five points changed in order to increase the flow for the reader. Um, many presentations as well. First and the last slide must link to each other. And I get a cohesive story. But I need to make sure that the next six slides build up to a strong conclusion that's linked to the first slide. So keep make sure that you are specific in how you want it back, not just want what you want back, in which format, in, again, in tables, in a spreadsheet, in a paragraph, and so in which language. And I'm going to show you some of the language things. Almost at the demo, a few more slides. Tone setting for effective AI interaction. Understand how to set the tone and style for AI responses. Learn to specify the tone from formal to casual to align AI outputs to your communication goals. So here's the example, write a formal proposal for a new research project on climate change aimed at scientific a scientific community. So, and, and again, now you could have added here that I need it in the form of a white paper. And you can even give it, maybe your institution have a specific format on how a white paper or an academic article is formulated or how your client proposal is formulated. This is great for RFPs, request for proposals. I want this from you in order to, so as a buyer, I need to write an RFP on buying water coolers uh, and et cetera, et cetera. But I want you to give it to me in this format back. So what's the tone? Is it formal? Is it casual? Is it friendly? Is it stern? Put those keywords in there. Response length calibration, calibration. How long do you want the response to be? Is it just brief? I just quickly take this information, give me a one paragraph email to send back to the client. Give us, take this detail and give me the outline for a 400 page book. Now, a, the, the platform will not write that 400 page book for you, but it'll give you the outline and then you have to go back to each chapter, maybe for ideas, for layout, etc. But how long do you want the response to be? I and mean, in what format? But and, and again, is it is it at length? Is it just one line? Now, I find ChatGPT a great tool to summarize things. So I often, when I write for business day in particular, and now my articles are 550 words because it's a printed paper and space is limited. But I find at the end of my articles, my draft articles, that I normally write about 800 words to kind of get my point over. And then I will ask ChatGPT, take this text and summarize as best as possible into just 550 words. But I need you to keep the following three key points in those paragraphs. It is great for doing it, or well, it's great for expanding it. Yeah, here's a short article I wrote, but I it's 400 words at the moment. I need you to expand it to about 800 words. It's very good at doing those things. What is the response link that you require? Write a detailed 500 words. See, detailed, uh, expert or detailed, 500 word analysis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How long do you want the response to be? All right, I'm going to demo that to you in a bit. So, it's quickly on ChatGPT plugins, and again, the same is uh, 
you can use in, in other platforms where you can interface directly with other platforms. Um, so for instance, you'll see when I bring my chat GPT up, I, I brought in a, a Google Chrome uh, thing to, in, to essentially load a document into the chat because normally chat GPT doesn't necessarily have that file upload function. So I look at a plugin so I can upload a PDF and ask it to analyze it or a Word document. There are so many. Again, this is where the multimodality comes in. Connect to this audio source. Connect to that video source. Uh, connect to this internal system or that kind of document. Now, if you go to this website, um, the ChatGPT plugins, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of them. They are mostly free. Now, the same is true whether you use the Microsoft platform or the Google platform. But go play around and look for plugins that will make your life easier. So rather than copy and pasting the text of a document, why can't you just pull in the, the whole document? Why can't you just pull in the whole audio file or the whole um, uh, picture? So plugins are incredibly helpful. And again, there are hundreds and hundreds of them. So yeah, in the next few minutes, I just want to do a bit of a demo. Again, since I can't see anything, Pauline, is everyone still with me? <laughs> yes, still good. Can okay. everyone maybe just give us a thumbs up if you're all good? Hi. Right, I maybe just, uh, Yuan, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. I'd like to add. So just for our sure. audience, keep in mind that plugins, um, especially now that AI tools have become more and more popular, a lot of these uh, original creators are obviously putting paywalls behind a more advanced version. As Yuan mentioned, he uses the paid version. And um, the paid version normally gives you access to more of these awesome plugins. The more you go for a free solution, the less awesome plugins you'll get access to. So this is obviously not a sales pitch for you to purchase ChatGPT. The point is that um, the more you invest in these tools, the more solutions you get. But I think Johannes is an advocate of this often is start with the basics first before you start exploring the cool stuff. So for what it's worth. Absolutely, I mean, it's so true because the basics is probably all you need for now. Um, and the same with the plugins, they are mostly free, but you know, they will give you like a limited time version or they'll give you a limited, um, kind of call it scalability or featured version. Credits, play, I think they call it credits. You get I like think so credits. too, yes. So, so play with that plugin. Does that really automate your task uh, and whatever that task is efficiently? And if you say, well, this really helps me, then it's maybe worth paying the $10 a month or whatever that plugin costs. So, so on the screen here, you can see I've got chat GPT open again, the prompting here. Here's the, the one plugin I have where I can submit and upload a file. Obviously, here's the, the, the recent interactions I've had with it. I also have Google Gemini open here. Same thing. Here is my prompt. Here is my recent history. So if I go back to that particular topic, employee data analysis because it's got all the data and the context of that specific prompt. I'll go back to that. Now, I must say, I, I only in the last two months or so started playing with Gemini. And I, for most of my prompts, use both ChatGPT and Gemini. Because in certain ones, the one is just much better than the other. And I'll give you some examples. And I also have Google Translate open here because I want to show you um, how great it is at translating Afrikaans and Zulu and Klaza and those kind of things and a few other examples. So the, the first thing, and I've just prepared a few things here, is I would say, give me a summary on the data building. Okay, so I'm not giving it the data yet. It's going to now say, okay, what, what must I give you? I'll quickly just do the same in Gemini. You know, the same with the data building. Let's see what ChatGPT wants. Okay, please provide the data. Let's see what Gemini says. I'm still thinking. Okay, well, I don't know where it's getting that from. <laughs> okay, the data I want to use is a spreadsheet I downloaded from the internet. This is just call it fake data. It's essentially an employee list. It doesn't relate to any real people. So employee ID, full name, job title, department, business unit, gender, ethnicity, age, hire date, annual salary, bonus percentage, country, city, um, and so forth, and then exit date. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this, but if you just take, if you just click and drag, you copy this whole spreadsheet, right click copy. I'll go back to chat GPT, this browser. This one here. And all I do is I paste it, and you'll see it'll paste it as text. Now, see here, it's seeing it as an image. Mm -hmm. I just want to delete this, paste it as text. 
Okay, so there is just a copy and paste of the spreadsheet. Okay, we're going to let it run. Let me go to Gemini. Um, it's already given me some. It's copy V. I see. But here's just a trick I use often. I go to my notepad. If it's seen it as an image, I'll paste all that data in there. Control A, copy. Go back to Gemini. Now it'll hopefully see it as text. Control V. There we go. Right, now. Gemini struggles with this sometimes. Let's look at chat GPT. Okay, here we go. Data provided is summary, blah, blah, blah. Okay, number of employees, 26 departments and roles. Uh, demographics, gender, mix of, mix of male and female, ethnicity, predominantly Asian, with representations from et cetera, et cetera, age ranges from so and so. So it just gives me a high level sum summary. Now, let's see what Gemini is still thinking. Okay. okay let's ask it. Um, the nice thing is you can make some serious spelling mistakes, and unless you're really bad, and sometimes I am, it will pick up what, what you are saying. Tell me more about the gender split. Okay, that's a simple prompt. Let's see what it does. It's great for spreadsheets. I'm going to show you an example of a balance sheet as well. Now it's giving me the names. I guess not quite what I asked for, but okay, these are all the males, and it's going to give you all the females. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, is the uh, gender split problem? Let's see what it says. It's a breakdown. Males 15, females 11, gender split of the workforce, et cetera, et cetera. So you can now even ask it, like, if I want to get my ratio from a gender balance point of view right, how many more females do I need to um, employ? Even the, because remember in that spreadsheet, we have the start date, so it'll pick up the regularity of employing new people. And then it might, for instance, say, and I'm not going to do it here now, that for, I can see you employ on average, two people a month. Just make sure that there's a focus on attracting and employing females for the next six months in order to get your balance right. Okay, now here's where we're going to play with um, language. Okay. So, Jim and I still think, oh my word, okay. Look at this. Explain this to a child. Imagine you have a big box of crayons with two main colors, blue and pink. So you see now it's explaining this whole gender thing in a way that children should should understand. And okay, let's look at this. Explain it in Afrikaans. Stel jij voor je een groot box krijten. So it's still obviously going to the previous prompt, which is for kids. Now, I'm not a Zulu speaker. That's why I got to Google Translate. And if you are a Zulu speaker and it's incorrect, you have to tell us, please. Do it in Zulu. Now, we have a massive problem in Africa regarding languages, because we have about 3,000 different languages and dialects on the continent. And most of the platforms we consume are English, Portuguese, Spanish, French, and so forth. But this kind of technology can really help us. Um, so, if, say, for instance, you, you're a person living in a rural area somewhere in Zimbabwe, and English is maybe your third or fourth language, but you have a mobile app where you can ask for medical advice. If it is in your mother tongue, it will obviously help you so much more than in a tongue or a language that you don't really understand. Okay, copy and paste. There we go. So it is looking again. I will know, but this it seems pretty accurate. It's all right now. If you really want to play, and I'm almost done with the demo. Um, ex whoopsie. Um, explain it as. In spelling and whatever, that's why the path. Sometimes it bombs you out and say this is unethical. Uh, we we don't uh, promote uh, being psychopath, etc. But I'm sorry, see, I can't assist you. Right, this sometimes this work do it. Uh, oh, so assist spelling. Let's see what it does. Okay. Now you'll see it'll typically do what narcissists will do. Now it's still linked back to the, the child explanation, but it would, as a narcissist, typically say, I'm the only one that can answer this question. You have to listen to only me. Don't listen to other people. Very interesting. Okay, so let's stop this one and start a new chat. What I've got here is just two or three more things. Here's the balance sheet of the BMW group. Obviously, it's listed, so it's publicly available. 
uh, get some tables first. It doesn't really matter. Let's just again, I'm just going to take copy it. Why not? I can copy it. Um, let's say analyze this. Now, I'm not giving it specific instructions yet. Just literally Control V, or Command V if you're on a Mac. Let's see what it tells me about that uh, balance sheet. Go down. There we go. So it's going to give me some just general information on the assets and so forth. And again, this is why you don't want to take uh, confidential information in an open platform like this. So rather do it in a ring fence platform if you have that. OK, so I'm going to just stop it and say, what are the business risks? Yeah, I don't know what it's going to tell us. Let's see. Interesting to play with. So looking at that balance sheet of BMW, several potential business risks, inventory management, and so forth, and so forth. So how interesting is that? All right, so when you have spreadsheets and data and you want to find a quick analysis or you want it to give you input or ideas that you might not have thought of before, these tools are really great. So let's stop there. And let's go to point one. So expand on inventory management risk because it's just given me a short paragraph now. Okay, so it's going to give you more information. All right, proposal in 400 words on how to fix it. So that's what I often use is when, when I ask it for, especially from an idea generation point of view, give me five potential talking points on this topic. And there are, there are one or two uh, points that I really like. I start asking you to expand it more and more, and then I go back to the principles I've already shared with you. Do it as a, do it in order to, do it at that length, and so forth, and so forth. So yeah, there's some very interesting information that's given me here. Two more things I want to show you before we go to Q and A. Um, so here is a YouTube video. This is where you can see Gemini being a Google product and YouTube being a Google product. It works better. I just want to stop this ad. Um, this is just a, a video on Trump. Very interesting. So let's just take the URL. You see, I can do it up here as well. So now I'm going to ask ChatGPT to start a new chat. Otherwise, it'll get confused with this context. Um, say, I'll subscribe this video. I'm going to put the YouTube URL in there and then copy it. You're going to see ChatGP struggles. It can't access that URL. I'm able to blah, blah, blah. But now look at what Gemini does. You chat. So just give me like a documentary or a, or a, a training video and transcribe it for me. So now it's accessing YouTube. Ah, oh, why not? I wonder if it's because it was an ad. Let's go to another one. I want to quickly show you. Normally works. I, th I think it's because of the nature of this video, because it mentioned copyright restrictions, so maybe it takes uh, some generic instead of yeah, political. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Well, this might be the same. Uh, let's see. Transcribe. But the point here is that it normally gives you either a summary, or depending on how you prompt it, or a word-for-word -word transcription of that video. And then you can start playing with it. See, here it goes. It tells us what it's about. Now I can ask it to write this as an article for an audience X. I'll take this analysis and give me the five top points that I can use in a PowerPoint presentation. So when it comes to Google related products, obviously Gemini is much better. The last thing I want to show you, I want to write an article on quantum computing. So I just said quantum computing explained. I looked through some of the URLs. Here's one here on Amazon. There's one here from IBM. And there's one here from well, Investopedia, whatever they are. So what I've done, this document, I said, use the links below to give me an outline of an article on quantum computing. So I've taken the URLs of the articles I'm interested in. Now, sometimes, depending on the website, it might say I can't access that website, but most times it can. Let's just go to chat GPT. So I've given it, when I've given it context, I've given it information, and I want an article. Now I can prompt it even better to say for a business audience or an outline or a 500 word article, et cetera, et cetera. And I just see if you can access those URLs. Typically can. Thinking, <laughs> while it's doing that, here's the other example. I need to prepare a few slides on the impact of technology. Also give me slide pictures. 
So now it's gonna slow thinking. It's trying to know. And then I'm almost done now, Colleen, and we can get to some questions and answers. And this uh, is where the more great examples. Um, I think okay. what everyone needs to pick up on, which I've picked up on specifically again, is how many times you prompt before you get what you actually need. And I think a lot of people think AI just needs one prompt and we'll get what we want. Um, I say speak to it like it's a human that knows nothing, but with all the knowledge to eventually give you the answer. So here it's just in the previous example, I've given it the links it must access and give me a summary. And now based on this, I can say the slide deck, a, uh, a article and support. Um, and then let me just use that other example to see what it does. It's normally quite interesting. Okay. Very few slides on the impact of technology also give me slide oh. pictures. Let's see what it does. Oops. 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 They are still working. In this case, chat GPT is often quicker. And it's kind of a lazy way to do it. Now you still, and I think this is like a key thing I want to mention, and it goes without saying, you still have to verify this information. You can't just use it blindly. Uh, sometimes I ask it, give me the reference link to where you got this information. Chat GPT struggles, Gemini normally does not. I need to go double check now. If I write an article on AI, which is a topic I know well, I can just scan it and see whether it's true or not. But if you ask me to write an article on brain surgery or on financial advice or on legal matter, I'm not an expert. I have no idea whether it's giving me nonsense or not. So I need to ask an expert or I need to go and look at all the reference material. So, okay, so I've asked it for a slide layout and I've asked it for images. See me, Gemini is very nice to struggling. Here it's not going to give me an image. Sometimes it only gives you one, and then I would say give me a, a suggested picture for every slide. And then start giving me some interesting pictures. I just wanted to here we go. Now I can decide whether I want to use that or not. So I think with that, Colleen, let me just run back, see if I can get my camera going again. Yeah. 